uh, what martial arts system should we be training in and what should we also be cognizant of recognizing that we may uh, or invariably we will uh, be surprised and does our system provide any allowance for being in the middle of that frenzied fray will it work um no All right. Hey, folks, we're doing a book review and some of you already like just what was this book review? I'm out. And for all you guys who want to actually read and learn and you kind of have that uh, warrior poet drive uh, to be better. Uh, here's an incredible book. It's called Meditations on Violence. And I liked it enough that I uh, tracked down the author. He's on right now. Chilling here. I'll give you a quick flash of him. There he is. That's me. Uh, this is Rory Miller and it absolutely incredible resource. So if all of a sudden I track down the author and throw him on here, it's important. And he also has that kind of dad joke, cheese ball sense of humor that only a few of us out there like, but I happen to love. Here's his uh, biography about himself. Uh, he put middle-aged white man, height and weight proportionate, athletic, non-smoker, in search of insight, new knowledge, and dare I say wisdom. Already found true love is an incurable romantic, very warrior poet-esque, who believes in doing the right thing. I enjoy long sword fights on the beach, spectacular sunsets in my opponent's eyes, and the feeling of a job well done. So, uh, I mean, he's, he's certainly a, a serious dude in terms of fighting. He knows his stuff. I have a, uh, I can sense the BS a good while away and immediately like this resonated and I learned a lot. I was bunny earing pages, underlining and stuff. And my intention here is, is to ask Rory, uh, one, to help walk us through big points of the book. So in case you're like, oh, I'm never going to read it, at least you'll get a few highlights. You'll hear from the man. Uh, and I'll also uh, kind of drive him in some directions that he didn't cover in the book. So without further ado, Rory, say hello. Hello. And I want to be completely deadpan now because you brought up the cheese ball stuff. <laughs> but you, it's okay. But I, I'm not going to be able to. Dude, own that junk. Be like, I'm a cheese yeah. ball, bro. Dad no. jokes for life. I am serious. There is no <laughs> laughter in Rory's world. <laughs> I bet. Okay, so first off, what is the book about? Give us a, a, just a real quick glimpse of background and why did you feel motivated to write such a book? Um, there's an essay in the book about baggage, about all the stuff that came up in one year and uh it wasn't settling it, it's one of my best traits is that i never took stuff home it, whatever happened i that was work i'd come home it'd be fine i never hit it never you know my wife could never possibly understand that people are way tougher than we think they can understand stuff um but it never kept me awake never had issues never had the only recurring dreams i had from working at jail were an uh, infinite hallway with every five steps, someone asking, whining for something behind the door. The, the fights never stuck with me. And then um, one year I was volunteering for Search and Rescue 2, so we had our first body recovery and a friend committed suicide and just a whole bunch of crap all at once. Um, and, you know, martial arts have been something I've been doing for my whole adult life. And it was the place where I would go for I'm trying to cover the word kind of whenever, whenever life was hard, I would go on the mat and I'd get pounded and pound and have a great time and everything had perspective. And I was going on the mat and it wasn't working and talking to people wasn't working. And I just wrote some stuff to get out of my head and it became that book. And so it wasn't the, the real contrast between what's, what was going on at work and, and the martial arts was the disconnect. Cause I'd always thought of martial artists as my people. And then when things got really intense, they didn't have any framework to understand at all what I was talking about. Gotcha. So there was a disconnect between what you learn and different mm -hmm. martial arts systems and the dojo between mm -hmm. what would actually happen as your time as a corrections officer. Is that what you're saying? A, a little too concrete for that. It's, it's, um, a guy named Chris Wilder asked me to do a seminar, or it was a group seminar, so he asked me to sit in. And at one point, I was given the, a talk, and I just go, okay, what we're talking about is like assaults. We aren't talking about fighting. That's, and everyone's face went blank, and no one in that room had ever 
even entertain the idea that a mutual and a fight and assault were different things. And hopefully it's completely common knowledge now, but it, at that time, which is, would have been about 2002, 2003, mm-hmm. it, was, it was one of those thoughts that had not even entered people's heads. Well, since you went there, let, let's go ahead and not assume. And, and before, what I'm going to ask you for is tell me the four basic truths of violent assault, and that'll be a good way to, to distinguish between fighting, UFC, fighting, and an assault. Yeah. So we're looking for the four basic truths of violent assault. Guys, before Rory answers, though, I want to tell you, you spent 17 years as a correctional officer. Yeah. Right, uh, he's been studying martial arts longer than I've been alive, so he's very, very, very old. Um, very just old. <laughs> no, that's okay. You're supposed to get I, more I, offended than that. It's more fun. Not everyone I know lived to be this old. I'm actually kind of proud of it. <laughs> uh, anyway, just a wealth of knowledge, multiple mm. black belts, tons mm. of different uh, mm. fights that he's been only in. Only one black world. belt. Uh, one black belt, and m- only uh, one. Many, and many, I didn't many, even many want fights. that one. <laughs> you didn't want it. Very good. I didn't so, want it. Uh, key off here and tell me the four basic truths of violent assault as distinguished from fighting. Faster, harder, closer, more of a surprise. Okay. Um, you want me to break that down more? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, when someone's fighting you, there's always that balance of offense and defense. So if you, if you time um, how many punches are thrown in a boxing match in a second, it's actually not that big. When someone thinks that they can surprise you, totally untrained people hit four times a second. They aren't defending themselves at all, so there's no time. So it's all just a flurry of attack. Um, harder, there's nothing to protect their hands, so they use tools. Um, most people in martial arts, you want the person to go to work the next day. You want them to come back to train. You're trying to make them a better person. So even serious martial arts rarely felt anyone unload. Yeah. And by unload, I mean the kind of... Not that I need to keep my balance to be ready to defend myself, but he's not looking. I'm going to hit him as hard as I can. Um, the closer, almost everything involved in any kind of sport is based on how to cross the distance to safely get in there, do what you're doing, and get back out. Right. And that's that's everything from, from wrestling to, fen- to swords. Right. Um, when someone wants to ambush you, they're going to try to either set it up so you don't see them. Or set up so you do see them, but you think that they're a friend or they're neutral. And then when they're fully in your range, when there's no chance you can beat the action-reaction gap, um, that's what they're going to attack. So they tend to be very, very close. Okay. It doesn't happen where someone needs to take a step and a half away. And surprise, as a rule, you walk away from everything you see coming. Mm-hmm. You Anything you can see, you can avoid. So pretty much by definition, you're going to be hit by the one you didn't see coming. Fair enough. So... All right, cool. Hey, uh, that be I'm sure you've gotten this question a ton of times, but if I mm-hmm. don't ask this, everyone in the comment section is going to explode the channel. Mm-hmm. So uh, what martial arts system should we be training in, and what should we also be cognizant of, recognizing that we may, uh, or invariably we will, uh, be surprised? And does our system provide any allowance for being in the middle of that frenzied fray? Will it work? Um, no. <laughs> and, 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 and this is in the same sense that, you know, will a hammer work? No, hammers don't work. They don't do jack shit by themselves. It's always a person using it that makes it work. If you're the kind of person that makes things work, if you can adapt under pressure, if you can sit there and, and, and force yourself to act, then you can train almost anything and make it work. And conversely, you can have what I consider to be the best ultimate and, I, I know people who trained in exactly the same thing I've trained in that can't fight their way out of a paper bag. Um, it, it's the, the method is, I'm not going to say it's not important, um, but the instructor is more important than the system, and the training methodology is far more important than what's in the system. If you go in there and play hard with stuff, you're at least used to playing hard. You're still going to get surprised that first time. It's still going to be unusual, but when, but when you've been playing with athletes, and the first guy that hits you is a, is a skinny crackhead who weighs like 130 pounds and has never worked out and has shitty. You're going to take that hit, which is harder than almost anyone has ever felt. But if it's only about half as hard as you get hit for fun on your regular training days, you're probably going to be all right. Gotcha. Um, so it's, it's not a what well, you should train. The, the one system I absolutely advocate is anyone whose job involves handcuffing people should take small circle jujitsu. Okay. It is the best thing I found for getting resistant people into handcuffs. Um, they're finger lock specialists. Gotcha. It's awesome. 
do oh. is not what I necessarily say for ambush, but if you handcuff people, fucking A. Yeah. Um, and you're a jiu-jitsu background as well as judo, which was your main yeah. bag before you found jiu-jitsu, and then yeah. uh, fencing as well. Yeah, I've, I've played with everything I could play with. Okay, so yeah. very good. Um, but ju- And judo I advocate because there are no bad habits. You learn how to take impact. You learn how to move a body. If you've got a good instructor, you learn how to move a body that's much bigger than yours. Gotcha. Um, so you could pick a, a fine martial art, but the instructor yeah. sucks, and so your experience sucks. You're yeah. saying, hey, find the good instructor is more important. And, and the thing you have fun with. If, you, if you're miserable every day at training, you aren't going to go to training very long. That's cool. Uh, um, so- no, I was just, I was just going to go in. It's, it's, it's a movement thing. I, and I would rather someone take um, gymnastics or ballroom dance and actually show up to class than take Krav Maga and not show up to class. Fair enough. How important is experience uh, for an instructor? So, for instance, he's an amazing martial artist. Maybe he's even read some books, but he's not been in a lot of fights. In in my world of firearms, there's some guys that are insanely good shooters, uh, competitors even, Mm -hmm. but they don't have that background in military or LE. They've never been in a real fight. How important is experience? Um. It's it's both critical and not important. And th- this is one of the things that's that's really hard to talk about. This is because everyone wants these nice, clean answers, and it's not. Um, for shooting the shooting world, um, you you came from a special operations background. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're used to working with a fire team, moving in where everyone's supporting and covering each other. How many of those skills translate to an 80-year-old lady who's getting a handgun because she knows she's not physically capable of taking on somebody? Yeah. You're a hunter team. How, how much of the skills of your hunter team um, were the skills that someone needed when they were ambushed by your hunter team? Right. So, it's, so that a lot of the experience, when we point at people with experience, it's not relevant experience anyway. Sure. Could you um, argue, well, it's still experience under fear and aggression like i'd see you in your book where you talk about yeah. you know whether you were climbing in a cave and all of a sudden you almost fall and your adrenaline flatlines you're able to think more clearly you're able to see it earlier and respond what about that in terms that, of experience? that was a burnout though that was medical that didn't make life better when, once you start <laughs> doing that then nothing's fun anymore sure. i mean because th- there's no such thing as fun without adrenaline either when, sure. once you get to the point that someone's taking a swing at you and it's just a job yeah. Um, then also you're pretty much going to give up kayaking and, and climbing because they're climbing is just, uh, doing pull-ups gotcha. and kayaking is just another way to get cold and wet. Can I get personal? It's, go for it. All right. Very good. Uh, so, uh, you'd mentioned, mm-hmm. and you mentioned this in your book as well, meditations mm-hmm. on violence plug mm-hmm. links in the description. Uh, I but, want to say which book, but okay. <laughs> this book, you did it in this book and I just lost First my train one. of thought. Um, what was I saying? You wanted to get personal. Okay, yeah. So uh, martial arts has always been a fallback for you. It's kind of been like mm-hmm. a retreat when the chaos of life or whatever, you yeah. could go work it out uh, in the gym. Well, what happens when it kind of loses its luster or you don't get that adrenaline anymore? You don't get that fix. Uh, do you lose your coping mechanism? Has it been a good long-term coping mechanism for you or how you doing? It was, it was for a long time. I Again, it depends on how personal. I'm in that stage where a lot of – a lot of old refire, retired fighters get where the big issue now is how to not drink myself to death. Gotcha. Roger, man. Cool. As long as you're getting personal, I'll go all the way unless it's discoverable. Yeah. Well, don't drink yourself to death, man. We need Rory Miller's. No, we don't. Yeah, we, we do, a man. Whole new generation. We got a whole new generation that's going to be 10 times better. I cannot wait to watch them. Yeah. If we stand on the yeah. wisdom of those before us. Like, like everyone else has. Absolutely. It's yeah. awesome. Right. I, I'm really excited with what the next generation is doing right now. Good. But if we keep learning from our yeah. peers, then we're going to have to mm-hmm. reinvent the wheel. And that's why you're on yeah. and I didn't bring a peer on. Right? <laughs> anyway, good to have you on. All right. Whatever. <laughs> just be like, thanks. Just say thanks. Uh, all right. I'm it's just going right. to say whatever. Say thanks. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, if cool. y'all ever want to make Rory feel uncomfortable, just give him a compliment. All right, so uh, one thing that I really liked immediately about the book is that we were very, very practical, no nonsense, and dealing in mm. corrections with 
you know, some savage criminals, mm. you're going to, you don't have the luxury of, you know, just mm. flowery martial arts. You're, you're forced into the pragmatic, into the real. So mm -hmm. it was a little surprising when you were talking about different training mechanisms to me where it looked like sparring, which I held up as a higher thing of like mm. sparring is more of the kind of best fake stuff out there as Tony Blower mm -hmm. had put it. But um, anyway, uh, there was that. And then, so it looked like you pulled a little bit down from the sparring and then you did something real unexpected. You exalted kata, which, you know, is in, in my wheelhouse of my martial arts background, mm. kata is... It's a big waste of time. It's just dancing around doing a form, and uh, maybe I'm naive, but but anyway, do you f still feel that way? And can you help? Yeah, do, yeah. The, anyway, the did I misunderstand? The, a little bit. Um, and I thought I was clearer than that. The kata I was talking about was two man kata. Okay. Um, and the the Japanese as opposed to the Okinawan and Chinese systems, and they do have some of those. Um, we're big on two man kata where okay. someone attacks you full force, full speed. And it's, it's a way of doing operant condition training. Yeah. So you get a re reflexive move to a specific attack. Gotcha. Um, so they tend to be limited, very short, um, very dangerous. We've had more serious injuries in kata than almost any other system I know has had in, in sparring. Gotcha. So if you don't um, move, you really get punched in the face. Well, and what happens to Uki, the, the person who does the initial attack and loses, um, tends to be incredibly violent unless Uki knows exactly what to do. Okay. Um, one, one of the, one of the specific ones, um, and, and these are, it's a very old system. So this is actually sword defense. Okay. Um, but there's one move, two moves, the third move, um, um, and it's much closer range than you think of for world war two combatives, but it's a world war two combatives chin jab. Mm hmm but you ride it until the chin is above the plane of the shoulders and you jump in the air and drive it straight down. And you're doing this full force, full speed. And, and within the kata, Uki is taught, when you feel the, the chin go up, you have to go limp because otherwise it will break your neck in training. Uh, yeah. So, I, um, go ahead. No, I just remember that part in the, in the book. Very good. Okay. Cool. So, so for sparring, I don't think kata, I think the solo kata, I don't think they're good training methods. Okay, good. That's what I wanted um, to hear you say. I, I think that when when almost everyone was illiterate and they didn't have video, it was their only option. Someone did something, was in a really dangerous situation, he survived, and everyone tried to remember exactly how he did it as much as possible. Okay. Um, but they, again, there are turns in Cotter that are there because the rooms were small, not because that was where you turned. People, the way they explain the motions tend to have nothing to do with the way people really move in combat. Um, the... Uh, and you brought up sparring. And the thing with sparring is whenever you train hard and fast, you have to have some kind of built-in safety rules. Um, with fencing, with weapons work, you can if you can make something about the same weight and a lot of the same properties except for sharp of your training, then you can use the same methods you would use. It still doesn't have the fear. Yeah. So it's going to be artificial. But when you're using unarmed arts, you have to modify the techniques. Right. Which means the modify modifications you do to make them safe become just as habitual as the as the attacks themselves roger so most people who spar heavy are better at not hurting people than they are at hurting people gotcha. they pull the punches in real life just like they do in sparring they and that that's scenario training is is the next step up and that gets some of that out of the way yeah putting putting on the armor and going for it harder yeah so I didn't plan. This isn't on my little list. I keep looking yeah. at of questions that I had for you, but it was in the back of my head because it really mm. just left an indelible mark. Mm. And you talked about in your book permission. You need permission <laughs> to defend yourself and permission to hurt yourself and you or uh, I mean hurt someone else in a violent encounter. I think we take mm. it for granted that if I was in the situation, then I would go full speed. Then I would really hurt them. Then I'd yeah. bite their jugular and. Uh, mm -hmm. rip their ear off and stuff, but you, you cited a uh, rape victim who felt was very, very afraid of being rude. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think there's been a whole lot of people that had that kind of feeling. Talk to us on uh, mm -hmm. early giving yourself permission to uh, do terrible, terrible things and imagining that. I, um, it's not enough to say the words. Okay. You, you have to actually know the values. Um, when you say give yourself permission 
to do terrible things, you're acknowledging that they're terrible. And that's one of the first things we have to get over. They aren't terrible. They're necessary. Okay. Um, you know, once, once you put a value judgment on them, that value judgment decreases your ability to do them. All right. Um, in the gun world, one of the common stories, I can't remember the state, uh, the lady with a baby who called 911 and asked for permission to shoot the intruder. And the 911 operator saying, you need to, you do whatever you need to do to save that baby. Mm. Um, I've, I've heard that in a lot of handgun courses. Um, how, and it's, it's relatively horrific that someone felt they needed outside permission to defend themselves. Yeah. Um, that they needed, and it was phrased defend the baby, that even defending themselves wasn't enough. They had to defend. Everyone is worthy of defending themselves. Everyone is a person. Um, and, and this is going a whole off on a rant, but one of the most fucked up things we've done in the last 20 years is somehow um, passivity has become a virtue. Yeah. Um, standing up for yourself is a sign that there's something wrong with you. How did that even happen? I don't know. You, you spoke about uh, as well, just kind of going off on that. You spoke at the very end of your book. And I mean, it was like a junk drawer of all kinds of wisdom. So, But it was... <laughs> Anyway, a junk drawer. It was yeah. like just here. Um, Definitely a junk drawer. I'll go with that part. A brain yeah. vomit of stuff you've mm-hmm. learned over the last 20 or 30 or 80 years, however old you are. Um, you like that jab? Did you see that coming? <laughs> it was sudden. It was fast. <laughs> it was mm-hmm. I stuck to the floor. Uh, anyway, yeah. you talked about uh, kind of the victim mentality. And, uh, mm-hmm. and one difficulty is is when you, uh, you've been victimized, it's easy for you to take on the identity of a victim and then you find out all mm-hmm. the benefits of victims and how as a victim and it's an unintended consequence but it also comes with now power over people and that, you know that would you speak to that so that i don't butcher what you were saying uh, go for it you're saying it great um one of the humans are incredibly adaptable and we will find success and failure we will find survivors of things that can't be survived Humans are amazing. But within that, when something really, really horrible happens to you, you find out that you can control other people by bringing it up. The part of your brain that likes power gets that right away. And sometimes that's the only benefit that comes from this horrible event. And people latch onto that. I think it's compounded now because um, societally we've decided that all power is suspect. Um, the only bad people are powerful and the being powerful is a sign of being bad, which is literally insane. Um, but within that, that's made victim power one of the only powers that we can find is virtuous. Yeah. And so people are not only feeling or using the power of their victimhood, but they're feeling re- self-righteous about it. Yeah. And, and you can watch you know, online, in person, depending on where you go, you can watch people having little contests about who is the worst victim. Interesting. You know, I, I look at this even in terms of American history. And if you compare textbooks that kids were reading for American history 100 years ago, it was filled with different heroes. Now, yeah. our greatest heroes are always victims. So you're going to learn about Martin Luther King Jr. over and over and over again. And we should learn about Martin Luther mm-hmm. King Jr. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Hey, way to go, man. You're a stud. Way to yeah. go. But nobody knows anything about Martin Luther King, whom he was named, or I mean, sorry, Martin Luther, the, the 16th mm-hmm. century German monk who, you know, was kind of the kickstart for the Protestant Refor- Reformation. Like, holy yeah. cow, Martin Luther King Jr. was named after, nobody knows anything about that guy. Now, that's not American history, but either, mm-hmm. even so, what I noticed, we don't have the strong people, the, the victors, you, usually it's the strong victims. Uh, but uh, in, anyway, mm-hmm. it's just interesting uh, not what is included in our teaching of history, but what is omitted, uh, which is mm-hmm. the real interesting thing. But it underscores your point. Here's some uh, things that uh, – here's some stuff from uh, the book, page 165. The benefits of victim status must be given up to outgrow the victim status. So if you keep using this, the – the yeah. b- the benefits, the grandstanding, the the power, the attention, the coercion that you get to display mm-hmm. as a victim, uh, you never cease being a victim. Uh, you have to put those benefits aside to uh, outgrow uh, being a victim, and you mm-hmm. can great power over uh, compassionate people. Don't you wish you'd thought of that? That's pretty good right there. It matches my experience. Yeah. 
don't don't try yeah. to claim credit for anything. <laughs> all right, that that was fantastic. Really, really good. Yeah. Love that. I planned it on uh, ripping it off. Mm. Uh, not really. I'll cool. give you credit. Good. Uh, let's see. Um, hey, the uh, information is important, not the source. Uh, I'm gonna, Run with it. I'm going to use the source, bro. It. I'm going to use the yeah. source because my big my big intention was to introduce mm. you to people and introduce this book. And you've written a bunch of other books. I am positive that they are. Uh, very uh, good and worth a read. Uh, so uh, anyway, I wanted to ask another question. This is, uh, you talk on predators that fish for victims. They're mm-hmm. looking for certain personality types that you said. Mm-hmm. So uh, speak about what are predators fishing for? What are they looking for in terms of personalities and personality traits? Oh, this is so easy. Yeah, I know, um, but it's relevant to the audience. I, I no, I mean this, I, this is something I want the audience to do. I don't want them to listen to me on this. Okay. Um, criminals are not any different than us. We like to think they are. We want to think that that people turn evil because it's magic, or something. They just want something, and they want something badly enough that no one will help them get that. There's that they aren't allowed to get, that they're willing to break rules for it. And we're sitting there going, oh, I would never do that. But if your kids were starving and no one's going to help you, um, you will, you'll make a list of things you'll do and you'll never find anything on that list that someone hasn't done for drug money. Yeah. Okay. So, so we get it. So what I, what I encourage people to do is don't, don't overthink this. Mm-hmm. It's one of those you're hungry or your kids are hungry or pretend you have a drug habit, whatever you need to do to get in a mindset. And then go look at large groups of people and figure out what the predatory part of your nature goes. That one would be easy. That would be easy. Not that one. That's dangerous. Gotcha. And we, we sense this better than we explain it. it. You know, so we can do the list, drunk people, distracted people, stupid people, needy people. Um, uh, the needy ones are really vulnerable. The ones that want any kind of, um, you know, who, who are suckers for approval from anybody. Yeah can become long-term victims that bothered Um, me when you said uh finding a kid that was particularly needy for affirmation and affection mm -hmm. you know um and and that all of a sudden because i mean like i've got boys and i know which Mm -hmm. one is more susceptible but anyway that Mm -hmm. immediately rose the blood a little bit and and it should because it's that's what predators are going to be looking at too um and it and my opinion the best way to to discourage predators is to make sure that good people know it's okay to be strong rock on uh uh, one more thing and this will be we're closing out here but uh there's different there's four different types of criminals that you identified in uh meditations on violence uh one is folks that made a mistake you know that okay i'm talking about people i had in custody okay yeah yeah, they they can be reformed so these are really Mm -hmm. these are types of people in a prison uh, is mm-hmm. I think your context you gave uh, one yeah. people that just made a mistake they can be reformed yeah. and spit back out uh, two was hustlers three was predators and four was special circumstances which really meant like illicit drug use and uh, mental uh, you know illness mm-hmm. that kind of stuff so with the four what are the big things that we should know about it and I really want you to kind of go into hustlers and predators the difference of it how do we know what we're dealing with anyway open it, up the I, junk drawer I use different language uh, in a couple of the later books, like facing facing violence is way better organized. So you you take the the things I was doing for self therapy and meditations, and it, meditations is basically a bunch of questions. Mm-hmm. Facing violence was shot the answers. Um, so I use slightly different wording in there, but going with the wording in the in the first book in meditations on violence. Um, sometimes people do things that are bad. And they aren't generally bad people and they realize, oh, my God, I should not have done that. And they feel guilty and they tend not to do it again. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have – and this is another one. How we handle it um, changes very much how it's going to progress. If you've really messed up but I tell you it's not your fault, it's, it's OK, you might start thinking it's OK to mess up in that way and do it again. OK, so it's, it's one of those people are adaptable and the standards they're held to are the ones they'll rise to. Or fall to. Gotcha. Um, hustlers, and there are a whole bunch of levels of this, and, and a lot of it starts with drugs. And you know, the thing: what would you do for your kids if they were starving and no one was going to help you? You get the basic sets of crime. Um, the basic sets of property crime is. Do I need to explain that more? Because I don't know whether I'm mumbling, and I uh, tend to go no, into I, my I th- own I think private you're good. language keep, really keep, fast. Keep driving. Okay. That's fine. Um, so when you talk about the hustlers, these are people that have taken that as their lifestyle. 
And within that lifestyle, you know, humans are incredibly adaptable. If you had to take some from someone else, something from someone else to feed your family, how long would it take you to convince yourself you're the good guys? Yeah. And that the people that you have to take the stuff to are the bad guys because they have the stuff you want that you don't. Mm -hmm. And um, if this is going to go on generationally, you're going to teach those values to your kids. Roger. And so, so with them, there's this subculture um, that as a rule thinks that what they're doing is highly illegal, but it's perfectly okay. Gotcha. Um, so just to, the, to recap, so, yeah. so sorry, um, hustlers, mm-hmm. uh, I think you said they make up most of the folks in jail. And when they're in jail, uh, they're virtually never getting reformed. They're studying up. Uh, is, I, is re- that- uh, reform is a really, uh, I don't want to say, and, and I'll go to rehabilitation. Okay, you sure. Know, spe- I may specifically have used, I may, I instead probably of reform. used the wrong word, but uh, um, drive on. It's a... Um, Rehabilitation fails spectacularly, and no one wants to hear it. Um, the number one thing is we could rehabilitate people if they were rehabilitated in the first place. Rehabilitation implies that they have a baseline that they can get back to gotcha. that's in line with societal values. Um, the other thing that we really mess up with rehabilitation is we have, consciously or not, we have this assumption we aren't trying to make people good. We're defining good as more like us. Okay. And when they live in this environment, they're going back to the same place with the same people. More like us is actually significantly less survivable. Mm-hmm. It would be a really bad idea. When you think about a, a jail psychologist trying to talk to someone about the proper way to behave, that's the proper way to behave in a university and surrounded by people that graduate from universities. Mm-hmm. If that person went back to their hustling friends – their meat. Yeah. And they know that. And, and also almost everyone that works in that, in that system knows that surviving in their, in the world that they live in is harder than surviving in our world. Okay. If you're surviving in a harder world, you're the superior creature. Gotcha. And yeah. it's really hard to fix someone who already thinks they're better than you are. They're Roger. smarter than you are. So that's, that's where that falls off. And, and this, again, it's, it's really hard to, to talk about this without people getting nutted up over the moral dimension of it. But taking aside the moral dimension, it's just pure survival. I wanted you to speak more on uh, the predator relationship. And you had some cool yeah. stuff in the book where you were talking about, you know, when a tiger attacks a tiger versus when mm-hmm. a tiger attacks yeah. its prey. How are predators different than hustlers? Um, the hustler wants, and, and again, I cleaned up the language later, but the hustler wants something. Their, their life evolves or tends to evolve around drugs. So that there's a constant hustle to try to get enough in there. A drug habit can be incredibly expensive. Mm-hmm. And again, because no one's going to help you with that and dealers tend not to take credit and there's, there's state systems to get all of your basic needs, but there aren't any good state systems to get your drug needs out of the way. It drives a lot of crime. Yet. <laughs> don't even <laughs> it's, um, who knows who knows what the future well, I, I, I wish i wish anyone I, I wish there was a good functional way to actually draw a line to see when people are helping when they're enabling sure because it's that's a fundamental issue yeah. um okay so predators yeah so in this um the predators and i again some the high level predators, there are two ways to go. Some of them, yeah, they're about stuff. They, they also want money, carjacking. They want something. Um, the best way to phrase it is that when someone is on the predator side, they're not thinking of you as a human being. They're thinking of you either as a resource or as a toy. Um, and when they're working from that, they aren't going to fight you. They're going to hunt you. Gotcha. They, it's not a negotiation. It's a setup. The, all kinds of things that we instinctively do when we're talking to people, they recognize that we instinctively do them and they can be used against us. Roger. All right. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Cool. Well, hey, man, that that's, uh, you know, I mean, I could go on and on because I have more questions, but we've been going quite a while. And if there's any brave soldiers cool. out there still, still rocking on at 
30 something minutes in we uh hey welcome hey good job guys cool. you got this far uh rory what do you have anything else to add something that you'd like to speak to everyone out there just to um as a rule no do you want me to say something try to say something profound or what no um, no it's it's okay. up to you just kind of like yeah any recent re mm -hmm. revelation what's the most important thing you have to uh to communicate to folks that may be listening in um when we were talking um earlier before you started recording mm -hmm. and you're talking about what the warrior poet society was about. Yeah. Um, it, it's not. And, and so I'll, I'll run with that. It's not about beating people up. It's not about being the biggest badass. It's making sure the people you love are safe as possible. And part of that means helping other people become as strong as possible. That's cool. And if you're, if you're strong in yourself, there's no reason to be afraid of other people's strength. So encourage everybody to grow. That's awesome. We'll train hard and train smart then, right? Hey, uh, how yeah. can how can we uh, find you? Uh, I mean, I'll have your book link below, obviously, and uh, Kiron Training. Go ahead and plug your stuff. Um, KironTraining.com, C-H-I-R-O-N, training. Um, that's the website. I don't update it as much as I could. Uh, Facebook's kind of a wash. I finally got that notifications, or notification saying you have 1,000 unanswered friend requests. Good job with that. And it was like, yeah, so they don't send any more after 1,000, so... I'm happy. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't um, solve the problem, man. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm uh, in a perfect life. I'd be a hermit living in a cave so, so under if, a rock. So, if we want to get in so, touch with you, do we page you or do we send you a fax? <laughs> um, it's, if you can send a messenger <laughs> smoke signal, I'm more likely to catch that. That's awesome. So uh, my oh, my smoke signal tag is is <laughs> one long, two short, and a long. So <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, well, yeah. Bear in mind, guys. This is Rory Miller again. Get his book. Cool. Read something other than a tweet. Uh, and uh, Rory, really nice. appreciate uh, your uh, your time and thanks for uh, yeah educating us. It was, it was fun. Good. So All cool. Right, man.